Hey, Deserving Listeners, I'm going to do one of my favorite things of all time, which is to read your emails on the air and answer them. I find your questions to be excellent and intelligent and thought-provoking, so let's get to it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist, and I'm also a professor. This first email is from Anonymous Patron. They write, I would love to hear you speak more about reactive attachment disorder. Recently, my therapist proposed to me the idea that I may have struggled with reactive attachment disorder as a child, and because it was left untreated, it is still affecting me as an adult. I was curious to see if you would be able to talk about how reactive attachment disorder comes to be in children, how it manifests manifests in adults, how it may be linked to other disorders like substance abuse, personality, etc., and how to treat, overcome it if possible. End of email. Yeah, great, uh, great question. So reactive attachment disorder. Now, for those of you who are lay people listening, you'll hear me often talk about attachment style or just attachment in general. You know, you hear me, you'll hear me talk about secure attachment, earned secure attachment, avoidant attachment, preoccupied, disorganized, fearful. Well, those are all not things that are in the DSM. The, the DSM is the manual in which we will diagnose from primarily. When we are diagnosing for insurance purposes and often for research purposes, we look to the DSM to provide us with a way of describing people based on their symptoms. There's a lot of research that goes in for decade, goes on for decades for each one of the things in the DSM for the most part. To be included in the DSM, it has to you know, f- meet a lot of standards and a lot of very stuffy authors will um, not let certain things in or will exclude certain things in, in later editions. But anyway, so The DSM doesn't talk about uh, attachment style. When I talk about avoidant attachment style or preoccupied attachment style, these are things within attachment theory, but they're not really included in the DSM. The DSM, uh, aside from this one disorder, reactive attachment disorder, and um, also disinhibited social engagement disorder, there is almost no discussion of attachment. So for those of you who are lay people listening to this right now, that might surprise you because I talk about attachment a lot and it seems to be a very powerful idea and it is a powerful way of conceptualizing why certain things develop and this sort of thing. And yet almost no discussion of attachment. Well, there's various reasons for that. One of which is just political within within my uh, field. There's just a lot of political movements and attachment dis- attachment theory hasn't really got a lot of uh, political juice over the years, particularly in the past, which is where the DSM comes from. But anyway, so but we do have this thing called reactive attachment disorder and what is also now called disinhibited social engagement disorder, which are both considered to be reactive attachment disorders. So these are in the DSM and they're only uh, applied to children. They're not applied to adults. So there's no description in the DSM for adult attachment issues. Now, one could argue that a lot of the disorders in the DSM are related to attachment, which they often are, but they're not described that way. Okay, but we do have this one child disorder that is referring to attachment. Now, what do we mean by reactive attachment? Well, what, we, what they mean by it, I believe, if I remember right, is due to attachment issues, there's this reaction and it's disordered because it causes problems. So you notice when I talk about avoidant attachment style or, rea- or preoccupied attachment style, those attachment styles can be a problem, but they also just could be not a problem. You could learn to live with the attachment style. You could learn to adjust for it. In order for something to be in the DSM, it has to be a disorder. And a disorder is defined by something that is causing problems in a variety or at least one area of your life, if not a variety of areas. Your relationships, your um, your work, your ability to function in life. And so in children, sometimes we have these conditions 
that are called reactive attachment or disinhibited social engagement disorder that cause problems for the child. It's not a way, you know, every child we would describe as exhibiting some sort of attachment style, but not a lot of kids would have the, you know, severity of their issue that would rise to the level of a reactive attachment disorder. And just to give you an idea of the, the prevalence here is that according to research within the past 10 years, they will look at all children and just, you know, they'll just drag in a bunch of kids into the lab and they will try to figure out, okay, how many kids among a population suffers from an attachment disorder in the DSM. And they find that 1% of children qualify for reactive attachment or disinhibited disorder. 1%. So very few children <laughs> qualify for a DSM attachment disorder. This means that the, the criteria are so severe that it really only captures a very small amount of people. Now, as you all know, as you should know, every child has attachment issues, though, because you can't raise a child without having some sort of attachment issues. But that's not in the DSM. All right, let's go into some detail about the attachment disorders in the DSM. We have first reactive attachment disorder. So for those of you who know me talking about avoidant attachment, this is basically the childhood version of avoidant attachment. So the, the symptoms of reactive attachment disorder are failure to seek comfort, avoiding eye contact, frozen watchfulness, frozen watchfulness, so kind of, you know, and hypervigilance. So the, so the child is anxious, but they're they don't reach out for any kind of comfort from anybody. And unpredictable reunion responses. So this is when you're reunited with your caregiver. It's, it's hard to know what the child is going to do. So this is, uh, will, you know, someone with reactive attachment disorder as a child will likely develop avoidant attachment as an adult or disorganized attachment possibly. The other attachment disorder in the DSM is called disinhibited social engagement disorder. This used to be a subtype of reactive attachment, but they actually broke this out. So it's called disinhibited social engagement disorder. So what do we mean by that label? Well, what we mean is that the children are not inhibited when it comes to engaging with other people. They, 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 they throw themselves at strangers, pretty much. So the symptoms in the DSM are seeking comfort from strangers, indiscriminate friendliness, so they're friendly with everyone, demanding behavior, so they're very demanding of your attention, they, they, they seek attention a lot, minimal checking in fam an unfamiliar setting, so if you, if you bring a, this child to a brand new daycare, they don't really come back to you to check in because because they basically dis, disinhibited types are preoccupied types. These people uh, are oriented to everyone else. Essentially, with these kids, they they often. So again, as I was saying earlier, there's a lot of people with preoccupied attachment. Something like. 15% of kids have preoccupied attachment, and I would say, I don't know, let's say 30%, you know, 15 to 30% of adults I would characterize as having preoccupied attachment. However, only 1% or maybe a half a percent of kids will have disinhibited. So this is extreme preoccupied attachment in a child. So attention seeking. Uh, they are indiscriminate in terms of who they attach to. They will cuddle with strangers. If you've ever been around a bunch of kids and a kid just gloms onto you, just clings to you without really getting to know you, it can feel really good. You can feel like I, I've actually treated kids like this, two-year-old, three-year-old, three and it feels good. You just feel like, wow, I must be a very warm person for this child to – warm up to me. I, I'm safe. That makes, you know, I feel very good about that. I feel bad that the kid is being very clingy to me right now. But now this may, might be that you mean that you're a very warm, safe person, but it can also mean that the child has disinhibited social engagement disorder in reaction to attachment injuries growing up. They will ask personal questions of strangers. They will also invade social boundaries. So at the grocery store, they might just randomly ask a stranger, like, why is your skin so dark or something? You know, kids and their funny questions. Okay. So that's disinhibited social engagement disorder. But we have an anonymous patron that is asking some questions about reactive attachment and, and 
in, in terms of the newest DSM that was published in 2013, uh, DSM-5, when we use the, the term reactive attachment disorder, we're talking about the avoidant type, remember. So I don't know, anonymous patron, what your therapist means by reactive attachment because there are uh, – I, I, I hear – there's so DSM changes from time to time, and you might find older – therapists and clinicians will still use the phrase reactive attachment to refer to both attachment disorders instead of just one type anyway. So I don't know which one your therapist is talking about, but if we assume that it's the reactive attachment and that you are avoidant, you know, so how does reactive attachment come to be in children is one of your questions. Well, generally speaking, when you have avoidant attachment as a child, it's because of emotional neglect that is very consistent. And this can be terrible emotional neglect, meaning absolute abandonment in an institution if you're an orphan child, this sort of thing. Or it could just mean that the parents are overworked or there's too many children in the family or the parents are just sort of hands off with their parenting. But in order to qualify for that reactive attachment disorder label, again, we're talking about like a half a percent of children will qualify for that because, you know, a full 1% would qualify for both of them. So, you know, very few children actually would qualify for a reactive attachment disorder. So if someone is qualifying for that, then in all likelihood, they were severely neglected emotionally as, as children. You also ask, how does it manifest in adults? Well, it's the same, it's the same thing, essentially. These people as adults will avoid eye contact because it's too vulnerable. And also they just learned early in life there's really no point in eye contact because to have eye contact will just open you up to hurt essentially. Uh, they, people as adults, they won't ask for help. They won't reach out when they're, when they need practical help, like if they're moving or something and they won't reach out for emotional help, like if they're sad. They might not even know they have feelings because they turned themselves off from their feelings when they were young. They might have anxiety. So those are all the things it, it, it can be associated with adults. You also ask how it may be linked to other disorders. Yes, people with reactive attachment disorders, children are much more prone to a variety of disorders such as substance abuse, such as personality disorders, narcissistic personality disorder, you know, potentially borderline, antisocial, um, you know, just any kind of, there are various different personality disorders that one could um, transform into, so to speak, from reactive attachment disorder. And like I said, anxiety, um, other OCD, these kinds of things. And then you also ask, you know, how to treat it or overcome it. Well, you know, you can't overcome it, but you can treat it. And the way that you treat it is through various different methods, but because it really depends on how it manifests. You know, if if for you, you have a hard time knowing your feelings, then doing some form of therapy that involves a lot of emotional exploration and expression and awareness and coping skills would be in, you know, in order. If it's the, uh, if the primary problem is that you don't reach out to other people for help and you're not very vulnerable, then perhaps uh, interpersonal psychodynamic therapy would be good. If it is anxiety related, then CBT might be good. So it really just kind of depends on the situation. All right, let's rocket through these questions and go to our next one. All right, this next email is from patron Ruby. She writes, I just finished listening to your over-functioner, under-functioner episode and shared it with a very close friend. We are both going through divorce and have found great comfort in our friendship. We both were over-functioners in our relationships with our spouses, and, and, we consequently, and consequently neither of us have ever experienced a level of care and ease of communication that we have with each other. We feel like we hit the jackpot. Is this to be expected with two over-functioners when they get together? What are some of the, pit, what are some of the pitfalls of this dyna dynamic? End of email. Yeah, so unless you didn't catch that, uh, Patron Ruby is saying that she is an over-functioner and her spouse was an under-functioner and that she has a friend who is also going through divorce who is also the over-functioner married to an under-functioner. And then she says that the, the care that they receive from each other 
is something they've never experienced before because they're two over-functioners who will be very caring and open and responsible enough to to you know have it be a mutual relationship in, instead of a one-way relationship. And she's saying, you know, is this to be expected with two over-functioners when they get together? And the answer is yes. So when two over-functioners get together, so it depends on the, the issues. And you also ask about the pitfalls. So let me talk about this for a little bit. So there's nothing wrong with being an over-functioner. I'm an over-functioner in a relationship a lot. And so is my wife. Me, me and my wife have a similar kind of enjoyment in that we look back at our past relationships and see that we were often, if not always, the over-functioner, taking care of people who were under-functioning. And then the two of us get together and we're like, wow, this feels good. <laughs> like neither one of us depends on the other person to, to mop up behind us. Both of us clean up around the house. Both of us don't need to be told what to do. Both of us make sure that we're always financially solvent. Both of us are responsible. We show up on time. Uh, we don't neglect parts of our responsibilities so that the other person has to make up for that. So it feels good, believe me, to uh, having a lot of relationships with underfunctioners in my life. I can, you know, I can attest to how nice it is to have an overfunctioner to be with. Now, what do we mean by overfunctioner, underfunctioner? Well, so we can mean a lot of things by this. One is is that we could mean that you're you're just very conscientious. That is a personality trait. That for whatever reason, your genetics or the way you were raised or whatever, that you're just very thoughtful and you plan well and your life is generally not dramatic or chaotic enough so that you can actually you know, keep your stuff together and, and your ducks in a row. So that's not being an over-functioner. That's just being very organized. So it's possible that Patron Ruby, you're just very organized and, you're pa and you're, the person you're divorcing is very unorganized. And so that, that's not necessarily an over-function or under-functioner thing. That's just a, um, a thing that just might have been present regardless of your dynamic. Over-functioning under, over and under-functioning is a dynamic that develops in a undifferentiated dyad in that neither person is inherently more responsible. It's just that each person polarizes into a role so that the relationship can withstand the pressures and anxiety. Let me explain. So, so I'll just take me and my wife, for example. We both over-function, but let's say that, and, and, and it's not a problem for the two of us, but let's say that there was something that was causing anxiety for the two of us. Maybe someone was sick or finances were bad or something like that. Or we have to do something and it's hard to accomplish it somehow. Well, in that situation, which you know probably occasionally happens, the anxiety raises in the relationship and each member is afraid of, a, of several different outcomes, including afraid of losing the relationship, you know, whether that's a conscious fear or not. And as that anxiety goes up, then what will happen is there'll be a tendency for one person to take on the over-functioning role while the other person takes on the under-functioning role. Now, why would this happen? Well, it's hard to know why this happens, but the way that I often conceptualize it is it's because each person can focus on a particular task. When a system has a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear and a lot of pressure that they're under, it's much easier if every person in the system takes on one job. It's sort of like if there's an auto accident or something and you and your three friends come upon the car accident and one person says, I'm calling 911. And then, okay, that person's calling 911. Another person is, okay, let's, let's make sure that the traffic doesn't come through here. And then that's one person's job. Okay, I'm going to go up to the person and administer CPR. Okay, that's what that person's doing. So it, now, that's a functional situation. It's very polarized role taking. Now, let's say all four of the people arriving at the auto accident, all of them do everything. They're like, okay, we're all going to call 911. We're all going to section off the traffic. We're all going to administer CPR and, and first aid. 
Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Now, if you are in a less anxious situation, then it allows for that flexibility because there's not this pressure of time. Well, when there's the pressure of time in and the pressure of extreme fear in a, in a system, which uh, if you've ever been in extreme fear in a, in a family, you know what that feels like if it's abusive or there's substance abuse or drama or conflict or hatred or frequent threats of breaking up, this kind of thing. It raises the anxiety. And so the, the system will bifurcate into all these different roles, will separate, they'll delineate, and they'll say, okay, you're going to overfunction and I'm going to underfunction. So the overfunctioner says, I'm going to be the one that's going to keep this relationship on the tracks. I'm going to be the one that makes sure that everyone does what they're supposed to do. The con to this role is I'm going to be cold, I'm going to be judgmental, I'm going to be critical, and I'm not going to be able to depend on anyone to help me. But the pro to this, this role is I get to feel superior, I get to make sh- I get a when people come to us, they always think I'm the better person, I'm the more responsible one, these kinds of things. I can, you know, so you get superiority, but you lose uh, warmth and flexibility. The underfunctioner gets something as well. The underfunctioner says, okay, I'm going to take care of the spontaneity. I'm going to take care of the fun. I'm going to take care of the creativity that this family system or this couple needs to exhibit. I'm going to take care of the flexibility. Now, there's a, there's a pro to that, which is I get to be relaxed. I get to be spontaneous. I get to be lazy when I want to. I don't have to worry about being responsible. So that's a pro. The con is I have to feel inferior. I have to feel worthless. I have to feel like a child. So each person gets something and each person loses something. But the system gains something, which is a little bit less anxiety because each person knows what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. So you see the difference between just being conscientious and organized and punctual and thoughtful and empathic and non-chaotic such that you can actually have the capacity for empathy for another person and care about them, which it sounds like Patron Ubi, you and your friend have for each other. There's a difference between that and two people developing an over-functioning, under-functioning uh, dynamic that becomes quite rigid over time. It, that the, one is a personality trait and the other is a result of fusion and undifferentiation and anxiety that the system does not have a functional way of dealing with. So the cure to the overfunctioning, underfunctioning relationships is not to yell at the underfunctioner to say, be more functioning. It is to get to the underlying anxiety that they have so that they can actually figure this out for themselves. Once you address that underlying anxiety and the, f- the fears that they have, and you either just cognitively help them de- you know, reduce the fears or help them have routines so that they can have a more, f- more functional way of getting their attachment needs met in the relationship, which is usually the case, then the overfunctioning, underfunctioning dynamic isn't needed and the relationship will right itself. Now, some of you out there might be saying, but wait a second. I'm always the overfunctioner in a lot of relationships. So it's it's independent of the relationship. Well, it could be again that you just have a personality trait in which you're very conscientious and for whatever reason you're attracted to a bunch of deadbeats. <laughs> uh, which, you know, it's it's not a, you know, crazy to think about that. But the other possibility is that you lack differentiation. And your style of dealing with lack of differentiation is to overfunction. And you will, whenever you meet someone, you might even be attracted to underfunctioners. And then as the relationship gets more entrenched, the overfunctioning, underfunctioning tendencies become more exaggerated. So that is my question. That's my answer to that question. Uh, you ask also. You know, you ask, you ask also. What are some of the pitfalls of this dynamic? Well, it depends. So, if again, if the two of you, Ruby, are 
just very conscientious and very thoughtful, then there's not really a lot of pitfalls to that. But if you're both undif- relatively undifferentiated individuals who tend to overfunction for other people, then in all likelihood, one of you will, if your relationship is undifferentiated and does have some underlying anxiety and, and thus a need for pathology to, to adjust for that, then one of you will likely start to underfunction. That is the nature of that dynamic. Is it ha- someone has to play the underfunctioner? That's the point. And even if one of the, even if neither one of you have has ever underfunctioned, if the anxiety is significant enough, and if the relationship is close enough and ongoing enough, one of you will probably have to start underfunctioning as a as a matter of definition, which I've seen before. Anyway, let's go on to another question. But first, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. This next question, anonymous patron, they write, have you ever heard about genetic sexual attraction? This happens when an adult meets their biological parent for the first time and they are sexually attracted to that person. What information do you have about it? I would love to hear your non-judgmental point of view. End of email. Yeah, so this is a rare uh, experience that people will report because, of course, a lot of people might have it and not report it because of social shame. But, yeah, I mean, it does happen sometimes. And I'll, I'll, I'll broaden it out even further that there are some cases where people will report sexual attraction in what we would call taboo relationship types, whether it's attracted to a sibling or a cousin or their own child or their parent or their long lost sibling or their long lost parent. And that's what you're talking about here is, um, you know, when an adult meets a biological parent for the first time. So someone's adopted into another family and they finally find their biological parent when they're 35 years old and they feel sexual attraction to that person. Well, sexual attraction is a strange thing and we don't have a lot of control over it. Uh, one could say we don't have any control over it. And so, uh, you know, as evidenced by the fact that particularly in the past, but around the world, there are plenty of gay people or bisexual people who due to literal potential uh, being killed because of it would much rather become heterosexual, and yet they can't. Uh, there are some cases where people have been have reported that they have managed to clamp down on their urges, but generally speaking, in the clinical world, we accept that your sexual orientation is what it is. And some people are attracted to children, and we call this pedophilia. And some of those people will actually act on that in a criminal and horrific manner. But many of them don't. It's just an attraction that they acknowledge that they know is wrong and they never act on it. And in the same way, there are some people in rare circumstances will meet their biological parent for the first time at the age of 25 and be sexually attracted to that person. And why is that? Well, like I said, we don't really know. Uh, There's different ideas, different conceptualizations. There's not a lot of research on it. But um, what I will say is there's a very there's various different ways that I conceptualize it. One is is that uh, it's possible for some people the overwhelming uh, nature, emotional nature of meeting your biological parent for the first time could result in you know some wires kind of being crossed. One one way to think about it, this is how I kind of conceptualize it, is that when you're a year old and you are with your biological parents, you're not necessarily thinking in a sexual way, right? Because you're one year old, you don't know what sex is. But all of you is attracted to your parents. Not sexually attracted, we wouldn't frame it as sexual attraction, but, but the whole infant, all of their emotions are oriented towards their parents. And one could say that a proto-sexual urge, not in the way that we understand sexual urges, but maybe in the way an infant would manifest it, are oriented towards the parent and really towards no one else or 
you know, most intensely towards one's parent, and that's normal, right? And over time, if the child is raised well enough, that uh, attachment urge morphs over time and becomes more specialized, and sexual attraction through puberty and beyond gets oriented outside the family towards other people. Well, let's say you were never able to, uh, you know, bond with your biological parent as a young child, and then you suddenly meet that person when you're 25 or 45 years old. Well, one way of looking at it is that that one-year-old version of your attachment, this very primitive, all-encompassing attraction comes out of you, and you feel all of the feelings. You feel longing, you feel like you wanna cry on their shoulder, you, you feel like you wanna hug them, and you feel sexual attraction to them. And the sexual attraction will be noticed because it will be the most shameful and concerning, but there's all these other things too. This happens in therapy all the time. We've talked about this before as well, and many, many of you have experienced this, where you will have massive attachment injuries growing up. You'll find a therapist at the age of 30 or 40 or 50 that it provides a secure attachment for you. And not only do you long for that person and want to be with that person all the time, you might even kind of stalk them online, but you also want to have sex with them and you feel sexual attraction, attraction to them, even though they're not your type sexually at all. They might not even be the gender of the person you're attracted to normally. So with a therapist, it's still kind of taboo, but it's less taboo than being attracted to your parent. But it really you know, stands to reason that it would be a similar biological or you know, psychological urge, if you will. So that's my way of conceptualizing. But you know, you'd really have to do case by case basis, and it would just be a conceptualization. There would be no way to really know you. And for some people, they might say, you know what, I, I'm not really attracted to this person. You know, this biological parent. I'm not attracted to them in terms of like I want to. I want them to be my mommy again. But I'm really, I'm only sexually attracted to that person. Other theories that people will put forward are that it has to do with pheromones you and your parents share certain pheromones. You share certain uh, ways of smelling subconsciously each other that can cause one to have sexual attraction be triggered in us. So that's another possible thing. The other possible thing is that w our sexual attraction is sparked by a variety of different things that are unknown to us. I mean, let's just take love at first sight. You know, you meet someone at a party and you're just like, boom, I want to be with that person. <laughs> I don't know what it is about that person, but I got to be with that person. That person has got to get into my bedroom right now, that kind of thing. Well, why is that? Well, we don't usually care too much about that. We're not, we're not, it's not, we're not ashamed of it. It's not a taboo relationship. We're just like, well, you know, there you go. Sometimes you're attracted to some. Well, it's possible that with your biological parent, you cognitively understand that the person is your mother or your father, but your body might not see it that way. Your body might be, this person is a complete, utter stranger to me. And thus, they are on the uh, list of possible sexual attractions, so I'm open to developing a sexual attraction with this virtual stranger. And if for whatever reason that person just happens to click all the right biological you know, switches in you, you might just sort of by coincidence be sexually attracted to them, not because they are your biological parent, but because anyone with those markers you would have been sexually attracted to. And remember that you know, our body doesn't necessarily uh, listen to our conscious mind as what we could, you know, there's a lot of examples of this. Like for me, when I had a panic attack or when I've had panic attacks, my conscious mind is everything's fine. There's nothing to be afraid of. This, this is just a, just a panic attack. Don't worry about it. But my body does not agree. <laughs> and my body always wins the day. You know, I, me, my conscious mind trying to tell my body something, my body is much more all-encompassing than the small little bit of neurons in the front of my, you know, prefrontal cortex. And so 
if your body just happens to be randomly attracted to this random person, but your conscious mind is like, uh, but that's my biological parent. That can't be okay. Well, your body doesn't know that because your body's never been around that person physically. Anyway, so there's probably other conceptualizations out there, but those are the ones that will come to mind. And let's move on to another email. All right, this next email is from patron Sarah. She writes, on episode 34 of your Darcy reaction videos on YouTube, you said something about attuned emotions that struck me in a very deep and significant way, especially the going into a dark room and feeling empty analogy that you talked about. I almost cried when I heard that because it has been something I've been struggling with for so long, but didn't even know it was a thing. It's such a huge thing that even people I know have started describing me as heartless and cold, especially when it comes to relationships and love life. Can you please talk about how one may overcome this? End of email. Yeah, so veterans to the podcast will know this analogy that I came up with a long time ago that I repeat because I like it, which is that for some of us, because we weren't raised well enough during a time when it's important uh, it's an important window of time that we develop our sense of self. We, as adults, don't have a sense of who we are. We don't know how we feel. We, if we do know how we feel, we're not very confident or very, um, uh, we, don't, we don't regard our feelings to be valid. We can, we can fall into shame extremely easily. We might feel empty on the inside. We might not ever know what we want to do. When I talk to clients and I ask them a question, like, um, you know, they'll, they'll be in some fight at work or something. And they'll say, yeah, me and my boss were in this fight and my boss really wants me to work overtime and we are getting this fight about it. And I might ask my client, I might say, this is just, you know, a made up story, but I might ask my client, well, do you want to work overtime? And the client will say, well, I don't mind working overtime. And I'll say, okay, that's good to know. But you didn't answer my question really because you said you said you wouldn't mind working overtime. Do you want to work overtime? And you know he'll say, well, but my boss really needs me to work overtime. And if I don't work overtime, you don't even want to know what my boss is going to do. And so it's it's much easier if I just work if I just work overtime. I'd be like, okay, so that's good to know. I'm still going to ask you, do you want to work overtime? You could, I'm not, and if you say no, that's okay. That doesn't mean you have to oppose your boss, but I, I want to know what is in your heart. What do you want? The client might still say, you know, I don't know what I want. I, I don't know what's, now for some people, this is just puzzling and perplexing. Like they'll just say, I don't, I don't know what's down there. For some people, this is terrifying because all they see is empty darkness and it's, it's a big, black bottomless pit of an abyss that terrifies some people. Borderline people, you know, more severe borderline people will often report this. And it's, terif it's terrifying. People literally believe that there's nothing down there. They think 100% of their personality is based on pleasing other people or, or trying to avoid being punished by other people. And nothing of their motivation is generated from within. It's all a reaction to the outside world. And for these people, they will feel like there's nothing there, but there is something there. There is a self. It's just a lack of connection with that self. And the analogy that I give is that you're looking into a bedroom and you're looking through a door and it's pitch black and you can't see a thing and you assume it's empty. You assume the room is empty. But if you had a chance, you could turn up the dimmer switch on the light switch, you would begin to see a bed and a desk and a chair. And then you turn up the, the lights a little bit more and you see posters on the wall, you turn it up a little bit more and you see little imperfections in the, in the floorboards, you turn it up a little bit more and you see that there's a book on the, on the table and turn it a little bit more and you see the, the name of that book and you turn it a little, little bit more and you see the pattern on the quilt and, you know, you turn up the light, eventually there's all sorts of stuff in there that you never knew was in there and you assumed it wasn't there. So how you say, how do you overcome this? And there's that word overcome that I'm not fond of because it assumes somehow like if you just, if you just sort of let go or something, you'll overcome it. 
I don't know what you exactly mean, but we 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 are healed from it. How do we heal ourselves from the damage that resulted in us not being able to develop a self? Well, the same is true for when we're a kid as it, as when we're an adult. So for two-year-olds, when they're having a meltdown, as a parent, you have a lot of different tasks before you. You have to deal with the meltdown and you know all the normal parenting ways. But another function that parents just, good parents just naturally do is they will, I, some of the time or all the time, point out what the child is going through. They will reflect to the child what's, what's happening. And they'll say, okay, right now I see you're really upset. And I understand that you're upset. But, that, but we're not going to, we have to, we, you know, like you're trying to say, okay, okay, kid, it's time to go away from the playground. We got to go home. And your kid just flops in the ground and has a meltdown. I don't want to go home. I want to stay here at the playground. And you say to the kid, look, we got to go. And the kid just completely falls apart. So as a parent, you're in a pickle here because you want to just throttle the child and throw him in your car and go home. But, <laughs> but you, you, know, you take a deep breath and you're just, okay, all right, this is going to take a little, plus all the other parents are watching me right now. Okay, uh, little Johnny, um, I understand you're really upset and I totally understand that you want to stay at the playground. I get it. Playgrounds are fun, and home is less fun. I get that, but we, but mommy, I, I, mommy has to go home because I've got to make dinner, and in order to make dinner, I I need time, and I know you're going to be hungry late later, and I'm going to be hungry later, and the rest of our family's going to be hungry later, so we got to go home because we got to move on with our day, and I and I get it that you want to stay, but uh, you know. You said we'd stay for 45 minutes, and you said, well, we did stay for 45 minutes. In fact, we stayed a little bit longer than 45. We stayed about 50 minutes because I saw you were having fun, and I didn't want to tear you away from it. But we have to go now because we got to go eat dinner. You are a terrible mommy. I hate you so much. I, you know, I get it, Johnny. I get that you, that you hate me right now, and I, I get it, but we still got to go. And that's what's just going to happen, and I'm really sorry to tell you. So let's go. All right. So in that little process, very, very brief exchange, the child is, I mean, it's probably not a two-year-old. It's probably like a three- or four-year-old. But the child is having a complete meltdown of emotions. They don't know what's happening for them. In, you know, they're, when they look into their bedroom, they don't see anything either. When you ask a, a three-year-old, you know, what do you want in life? <laughs> they're like, huh? I don't know. They, they're only thinking, you know, moment to moment. They're not aware of who they are. We often identify this phase with teenagers, you know. Well, you know, they're finding themselves or early 20s. Uh, the, you know, my daughter, you know, she, she's, she's finding herself. She doesn't really know what her career is. She's finding herself. And yeah, it, it extends into that time. But if you didn't find the foundation of yourself at the age of two, three, and four, then you're definitely not going to naturally find yourself at the age of 24. So you have to have that foundational experience where the parents were there. Now, parents who are neglecting or abusive or abandoning or depressed or sick or died, then that compromises that reflection mirroring process to a child minute to minute throughout the day. And as a result, the child never develops a, a sense, that foundational sense of who they are upon which they can build on when they're in grade school and beyond. So the way that you help an adult is you have to go back in time and treat them like they are three. Now you don't goo goo ga ga them, but you have the same principles. So you, uh, so patron Sarah, you're asking, you know, how do you heal from this? Well. You have to have other people, and you can kind of do this to yourself as well, but it really does require other people, a therapist, to basically reparent you and say like, okay, what do you want right now? And how do you feel? And then you're like, I don't know. I don't know what I feel. I don't know. And then the therapist might say, well, it kind of looks like you're hurt or it kind of looks like you're angry. Well, is it, you know, and then you might think, well, but I don't feel like it's okay to be angry. And then the therapist will say, it's totally fine to be angry. Your feelings are your feelings. And rinse and repeat that over and over again. And then another function, another task in therapy is the therapist or a friend asking you, how do you feel? What do you want? 
just asking those questions and leaving a lot of open space for you to step into it. So I do I do this with clients too. I'll I'll say like, what do you want? What's the purpose of your life? And the client will be like, I have no idea, and I don't even have a way of answering that question. I don't even know where I'm supposed to go in my mind to find an answer for that question. And I'll say, that's fine. But I'm going to ask you this question over and over and over again. And maybe it's on the 500th time that you'll have a little bit of an answer. But if I don't ask, those, if I don't ask this question X amount of times, and I don't give you the emotional, relational space to, th- to think about that with a secure, secure attached relationship between me and you, you're just going to go on with your day and you're never going to take the time to think about yourself because you learned long ago not to because no one else listened to you. So I have to create that for you. So you do this over and over and over again and people will begin to get connected with themselves, connected with their purpose in life, connected with their emotions, connected with their inner voices that tell them what to do. And as an example, for me, I had enough mirroring mirroring and love and attention and, and attachment security from my parents that helped me develop a self when I was two, three, and four years old. And for example, right now, I could be doing so many other things. I could also be procrastinating. I could also be doing nothing. But right now, I am 100% sure that I want to be answering emails for you as listeners. I, uh, you know, uh, an hour ago, I was on a walk with my wife and my dog around the neighborhood. And it suddenly occurred to me that uh, tomorrow, I don't have an episode. I don't have an episode recorded. (laughs) And I was like, crap, okay. Uh, I got to record an episode and man, am I looking forward to it? I was like, oh, I got to, we got to get home because I want to, there's so many emails I want to get to. And, and I really enjoy doing this. It has, it is, I know a hundred percent connected with the purpose of my life. I have fun doing this. I, I can feel the energy of y'all listening. And cause I've gone back and forth with so many listeners to, as I'm talking right now, and as I was thinking about talking an hour ago, it, it's in my bones. It, it, you know, it resonates with me. I'm just like, oh, you know, I, I, I can't wait to do this thing. And if someone asked me, Kirk, what do you want to do right now? I would say, I want to answer patron emails and record it and post that. <laughs> That's, there is nothing else I want to do more than that right now. And if they said, well, how do you know that? And I would say, well, because I can't wait to do it. And it gives so much meaning to my life and I'm motivated to do it. And there's just nothing else that's going to get in my way of doing it. That's because of a lot of things, but in part, it's also because I have a sense of who I am that I developed when I was young in a relationship with my parents that gave me the space to explore that. And they mirrored to me so that I can get in connection. You know, one of the things that I will say, another way of looking at it is that at two years old, three years, you know, so the kid having the meltdown at the playground. The kid, if you just walked up to the kid and said, what are you feeling right now? And, you know, he said to the kid, I will give you a $100 bill or whatever motivates, you know, that particular kid. I'll give you three cupcakes if you tell me what emotion you're feeling right now. The kid might say, I have, I'm not feeling an emotion. I don't even know what you're talking about. From the outside of the kid, we can clearly see the kid is angry and upset. But from the inside, children, they aren't aware of their emotions. And they sort of believe that their emotions are reality. And so when they're upset, they're so undifferentiated from the world that they just feel like, well, the world is upsetting inherently right now. And uh, it's not, you know, the world has changed and I with it is kind of a thing. Whereas as we get older and more mature and more in connection with ourself, we realize, oh, well, this is the emotion I'm feeling right now, but it might not be reflective of anything that's happening. I could just be in a bad mood. I could have misinterpreted something. Some sort of issue could have been triggered in me. And I know I'm feeling this emotion right now, but I don't know if it's rational. It might not be. Um, But whereas when you're young, you don't have that awareness. And so 
as the parent did that whole role play that I just role played out of like, oh, you know, I get that you're upset. I understand that you want to stay and play in the in the playground. It's very disappointing to you. It's a big bummer. I get that. I see that you're bummed out about that. The child is going at least subconsciously, oh, well, so mommy says that I'm bummed out. Mommy says that I'm upset because I want to stay at the playground, huh? It's this meta viewpoint that the child is hearing from their mother that gives them a chance to step outside themselves and look at themselves and say, oh, that's what I'm, that's what's happening for me right now. I'm having an emotion and you rinse and repeat this enough. And then the child goes on to do this to themselves when they're six, seven, eight, nine, you know, when they're at school and they're having an emotion, they have that meta ability to reflect on themselves. Then you just do that enough times. And by the time you're 24, you're very much in touch with your emotions. You know how you feel. You uh, can interpret those feelings to guide you in a way that get your that gets your needs met. And that's another point here is that when you lack a self, and you lack, meaning you lack of, you don't lack a self, you lack a connection with yourself. Sometimes I phrase it as a lack of self, but it, it's not a lack of self, it's a lack of connection with the self. No one lacks a self, everyone has emotions, everyone has things down there. You just lack a connection with that, or a sense of self, sometimes people will say that. But um, when you have that lack of connection to yourself, then you have no way of knowing, one, what your needs are, and two, how to meet them. So. Let's say that um, you don't have a connection with yourself and you know, for a week you're experiencing distance from your spouse and your need for closeness is being denied in your body and it is aggravating something down there deep. But one, you, you don't know that you're being aggravated because you're not in connection with that and, and you don't know how to interpret it. And two, even if you did, even if you're like, I think I'm upset right now because I've had a week of distance from my husband. So even if you did have a sense of that, you wouldn't know how to soothe yourself because you don't know how to monitor if something is actually soothing. So let's say intellectually, you're like, well, I think I'm feeling distance from my husband. Well, maybe if I, maybe if I watch TV with him, it'll help me to feel more connected to him and it will alleviate this pain that I feel on the inside. And let's say you watch TV with your husband. Well, because you don't have a connection with your emotional center in an unshameful way, in an unblocked, complex way, then as you're watching TV with your husband, you won't know if it's working. So that's the conundrum of the child or the adult that, that doesn't have a connection with their self is they don't know when their needs aren't being met and they don't know how to monitor if a behavior will help meet their needs. Whereas like for me, earlier today when I'm on my walk, this thing emerges in me of just like, oh, I have to record an episode. And then I, I think about, I sort of have this flash thought of, okay, when I get home, I'll you know get ready and I'll get my glass of water and I'll start answering emails. And immediately I get this feeling of joy and meaning and energy and motivation. And I feel it in my torso, in my body. I feel that all those feelings of joy and motivation and energy and anticipation and looking forward to it. And it feels like something. Now, I don't, it's not like a physical tingling feeling or anything, but I I feel it enough that I recognize it in my conscious mind. And then I'm like, ooh, I must want to do that. And so let's do it. <laughs> Whereas if you are in connection with yourself, you, you don't know, you can't even predict what behaviors are going to please you because you can't experience the valences associated with a behavior or a experience in the future. It's sort of a, another uh, a sort of litmus test for people is to think about what sort of food you want to eat and how you can interpret whether or not it's, it's going to be enjoyable to you. That's, this is one of the sort of the baseline check-ins with yourself is like um, it, for many of you who lack a connection with yourself, you probably at least know what food you want to eat and when, because this is so fundamental to us. 
that even you know if you have a, a shred of connection with yourself, you probably know what that feels like of like, okay, I can eat any dinner I want. You know, you're on your own and you're just like, here's what I want to eat. Well, you probably have the ability to say, I want spaghetti or I want a ham sandwich or whatever it is. And you can predict if I have that thing, I know it's going to feel good. Why? Because the last time I had it, it felt good and I liked it. That's a connection with yourself. Now, imagine if you had, if you lack a connection with yourself, imagine if you had that same process with everything in life, with your relationships, with your job, with your interaction with your coworkers, with your interaction with your spouse, with your you know career, all these different things. Well, that's what it's like to be in connection with yourself is that you can know what you want and mostly predict how something is going to feel before you even go down that road. Anyway, let's go into another email. All right, this next email is from patron Katrina. She writes, I was born into a cult, and in my early 20s, I left the cult. My closest friends from it still associate with parts of the movement and the community of the cult. I have developed many toxic and guilt-induced patterns from it and fear they have as well, but aren't aware due to being in a bubble. It is very narrow-minded and restrictive in the cult, and many of our parents got arranged marriages and don't really love each other. I was hoping to develop a community with them because they're very good people and dear to me, but I seem to get triggered often and enmeshed in their beliefs. Is there any differentiation tactics or reframing of the situation to help me to not be so triggered or consumed with my past? End of email. Yeah, so I've done a number of episodes on cults, such as Scientology. If you want to do a search for that, I talk with John Atak, who was in Scientology himself, extracted himself at the, the consequence of, of much intimidation from Scientology and has since developed a program and also an organization that helps people essentially um, become deep deprogrammed from these cults as, as they come out of it. And the central thing that I learned from him was that in order to help people get out of any high control relationship, whether it's a cult like Scientology or or whether it's a high control relationship like in intimate partner violence, domestic violence relationship where the spouse essentially beats you down and brainwashes you. Anytime you're helping someone to transition away from that high control environment, you have to go slow and you have to honor where the person is from, coming from and not just alienate them by calling out their belief system as ridiculous right away. Even though it is ridiculous, you just have to take it slow and you have to work within their world and slowly deprogram them. Um, you know, it, like with in a common example of a abused spouse, you might say to them, well, you realize you're being abused right now and that you should leave your partner because your partner is abusive and, it, and you deserve better than that. Okay, although that might be true, there's so many uh, issues or assumptions in that advice or that command or that perspective that the person within the high control relationship might be like you really don't know that it, it's it, there you're like speaking from another world and it can feel feel very alienating and judgmental and critical and and kind of crazy it's just like you're talking crazy because that's not how i think you know there's this there's this a, an assumption made about people in abusive relationships that if they were just given a way out, they would take it. But usually that's not the case because the abuser has infiltrated their brain and the abused person now thinks within the abuser's mindset, if that makes sense. And so you can't, you can't talk to them as if every day they wake up and think, I can't wait to get out of this because long ago they probably – gave up that point of view in lieu of the abuser's point of view in order to survive. But anyway, so patron Katrina, you're saying that you grew up in a cult and you left it, which I'm very, very happy for you. And you also say that you're still friends with many of the people that are at least kind of associated with the cult and you find that you get very triggered 
and enmeshed in their belief system. I don't know exactly what you mean by that, Katrina, but I could make some guesses. And you're saying, you're asking me, are there any differentiation tactics? Well, let me, get, so this is, this is the same advice that I give to everyone. If you're gonna meet up, if you're gonna go to Thanksgiving with your family that you frequently end up becoming undifferentiated with when you're with them and you, you know, like a common example is, okay, you know, you're going to Thanksgiving, you're going to Christmas or you're going to whatever family holiday get together. And you say to yourself, okay, I'm not going to lose control of my emotions like I did last time. I'm not going to lose control of what I say. I'm not going to get into a conflict with that person. I'm just going to let things roll off my back and move on. I'm just going to smile and be above it all. And the next day I'll be able to wake up in the morning and say, okay, that was not great, but at least I didn't involve myself in the chaos. And then fast forward to the next day and you did involve yourself in the chaos and you're saying to yourself, how did that happen? I was, I was so dedicated on the drive over. How did I lose it? Well, because the undifferentiated family ego mass is so powerful that our, even at high differentiation levels, we will lose a sense of ourselves the longer we are within a particular system, particularly if there are issues in that system. So it's a, it's a tall order to expect you, Katrina, to be able to differentiate throughout an encounter with these people, particularly given the high enmeshment level and the high pressure that they're probably, even, even if they don't want to, to put on you to assimilate to them. And with how familiar it is to you since you grew up with it for 25 years. So there's a, there's a low expectation of, in fact, I would, I would say given the way you've described it, Katrina, I would say, well, I would be very surprised if you could ever experience a high level of differentiation in that context, regardless of how many years of therapy you have under your belt. Murray Bowen came up with the idea of differentiation and he had very low expectations of people because he himself would try to differentiate himself from his own family of origin and found that it was very difficult to remain differentiated for even longer than an, a half an hour after in, engaging with his family. So you have to be realistic about it. But there are some things you can do. One is, is you can, I, I had a client once who had this very issue and what we, what we did with her is on the drive over to her family, she would put her watch on her other arm. And what this did was it was just a reminder. Cause you know, when you're wearing your watch on your other arm, it feels weird. And so an hour into the evening, as she started to lose differentiation, she would notice why is my watch on my right wrist? And then it would remind her, oh yeah, okay, stay differentiated. Don't, you know, so whatever you can do to remind yourself Another thing you can do is take breaks, like go to the bathroom and remind, you know, read a, a mantra in the bathroom to remind yourself to stay differentiated. Take a walk around the block or have your spouse kind of kick you under the table to keep you differentiated. So that's just to pull you out because if you don't do that, it's real easy to lose your individuality when you interface with other people. The other thing is to limit the amount of time you spend with these undifferentiated systems. Um, you know, because like I said, if you're with them for four hours, there's almost no chance the final hour you're going to be differentiated. So uh, limiting it to an hour at a time. Maybe instead of four hours every two months, it's one hour every three weeks. And so you can just dip in and out of those systems and thus be able to hold on to your individuality. So that's what I'll say to that. All right, I think I have answered enough emails. Well, let's read one more because I'm having so much fun. All right, this next email is from patron Noella. She writes, I was listening to your attachment theory deep dive and, par and the part you talked about avoidant people's memory 
And it made me remember something. So just chime, chiming in here, in the attachment deep dive, I go into all the various attachment styles pretty in depth. And one of them is the avoidant attachment style. And one of the signs or one of the associative um, realities is that avoidant people tend to f have worse memories about things. And the reason for that is when you're young and you're being neglected, you, emotionally neglected at least, you learn that it's better to just not encode memories very often because then you won't have to remember the fact that you're being neglected. And so avoided people tend to have worse memories on average. Anyway, so then she goes on to say, a few years ago, my now ex-husband was violent with me once. About three months later, he was violent again, which led to our divorce. The interesting part is, between event one and two, I completely forgot about him being violent the first time. And later I was talking with my psychologist and I finally remembered and was like, wait, that was not the first time he was violent. I'm not, I now remember the first time he was violent for the first time I remember that. I'm not avoidant, but my brain made me forget the first time. Could you please talk about that? How and why does the brain make us forget traumatic events? End of email. Well, memory's weird, and there's no way for me to know, for you, Noella, what exactly happened there. You know, why did you forget that? Uh, there's various different possibilities. Now, we would probably not say because it was insignificant. You know, we forget most things that happen to us. Um, last night with my wife, we were browsing the, you know, movie channels, HBO, and that kind of thing, and we came across single white female with... Um, with uh, what's her face and Jennifer Jason Lee, and I, I ha I, I know I'd seen it before because I actually had rated it on IMDb like 25 years ago, but I didn't remember the movie at all. I mean, I remembered kind of some of the scenes. So why did I forget that? Well, our brain just forgets things over time. <laughs> we just tend to do that. Unless we do something to make sure that we remember it, we will tend to dump a lot of memories completely from our brains. They're, it's not inaccessible. It's just no longer there anymore. There's this notion in movies and TV and in popular culture that the, the memories are down there if you just get hypnotized. But no, uh, for all practical purposes, the, the memory is has been erased. And that makes sense, right? Because a lot of things happen to us throughout the day and our short-term memory will remember things that happened an hour ago but we need to make room we can't we don't have enough storage power in our brain to record everything that ever happens to us anyway but your husband being violent with you that's not one of those things that you would commonly forget right so it would be something that would be quite significant. The other thing is, is you didn't actually forget it because you eventually did remember it. You just forgot that you remembered it, if that makes any sense. And it took talking about the second event with your psychologist to suddenly remember, oh, wait, I, that wasn't the first time. Okay. So there's a lot of possibilities. One is that we will section off difficult memories from us because they cause a lot of pain to remember that, right? So that makes a lot of sense. The other possibility is that when bad things happen to us, such as, you know, our husband being violent with you, it's possible that you didn't talk about it with anyone around you because you were ashamed or you didn't have anyone to talk about it with. When, when we don't talk about it, so, so he, here's how one way of looking at, you know, potential thing that happened was that he was violent with you. It was very upsetting. And you and your husband chose not to talk about it afterwards because it was it was so it was such a difficult moment your husband didn't have any reason to bring it up because he was ashamed uh, and you didn't have any reason to bring it up because you didn't think it was going to help to talk about it or something and you didn't reach out to your friends and talk about it you didn't reach out to your family you just you just in the moment said well i hope that never happens again and and you just sort of moved on with your life well, the memory is there because it's, it's a significant event that happened, but you have not talked about it at all. A big part of our ability to recall something is not only does the event have to be important or significant enough, but we also have to think about it and process it and talk about it and you know, do stuff with it afterwards, typically. Not all the time. I and mean, memory is very complicated, but 
but that's one way of looking at it. So uh, it's possible that if you had talked about it more or you know, had a therapist that you were talking to at the time and talked about it right away, that it would, in, it would encode that memory into a, a quicker access memory place in your brain, if that makes any sense. Anyway, but like I said, memory is weird and it is very amorphous and this happens all the time, you know, like uh, what happened to me the other day? This, uh, my wife just told me a story of something that happened. Oh, well, so I'm going through the website and trying to clean everything up. We, so a lot of podcasts have been around, but not a, not a lot of podcasts have been around for 12 years. Also, not a lot of podcasts put out like three or four episodes a week, right? So, and a lot of podcasts don't like to necessarily catalog every episode. Some podcasts do, but I do. So I, wanna, I want our website, which is completely run by me and my wife, There's, we don't get any help, <laughs> is I want the website to have every single episode easily kind of available and, and searchable and, and categorized and all these kinds of things. And so Anyway, I'm going through the website this this week, trying to clean everything up. It's taking for it's taking me. It's it'll probably take me like two full weeks of eight hours a day to to go through everything. But anyway, but I came across uh, this one episode that I had done, and I oh, it was uh, an episode on Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. In, in which me and Umberto talked about the psychology of eternal sunshine and spotless mind. I think it, it was three years ago that we made that episode and posted it. I don't remember a single thing about that episode. <laughs> I don't remember researching it. I don't remember recording it. I can't imagine what we talked about. I don't even know what we would have talked about. Maybe memory, uh, funnily enough, because the movie is about memory. I've seen the movie a dozen times. It's in my top five movies of all time. It's my wife's favorite movie of all time, that The Princess Bride, I'm guessing. And so it's not like the movie is unfamiliar to me, but the, but the recording of the episode, I do not remember at all. But if I listen to the episode, I can almost guarantee you that I would go, oh yeah, I remember now. So what is it with memory, <laughs> right? Well, we like to think of it as you try to remember something and then you remember it. But, you know, memory is, it's associations, it's amorphous, there's lots of routes to get to the memory, both in terms of how we think about it and our neurons. And, you know, so is the memory there? Well, now it's not. If, if I think, well, what did I talk about? I would say, I don't have a, it's blank. The hard drive has been erased. But if I start listening to the episode, like I said, I bet you anything, a bunch of memories would start to emerge for me. Now, why did I forget this episode? Is it because it was a traumatic event for me? I'm guessing not. <laughs> I'm guessing what happened was I researched the episode for a couple hours before recording. We recorded it for an hour. I, I did not talk about the episode afterwards with anyone. I didn't think about it. I didn't listen to it afterwards. It was just this three hour chunk of my life that you know was very isolated in terms of what I was spending my brain on. And thus, any long-term memory potential from that was not, uh, you know, realized because I didn't pay attention to it. I didn't talk about it afterwards, you know. But there is some memory there if I chose to listen to it and jog some stuff in my brain, you know, little bits and pieces here and there, I'm guessing. Anyway, as you might be able to tell, I'm not a research scientist in memory and... Any of you people out there who are, are probably throwing your phone at the wall. Because <laughs> memory is a very uh, complicated scientific area that if you talk to a memory specialist, they would have more sophisticated ways of talking about it. Um, but maybe they'd have similar principles that they would reveal. I don't know, though. Anyway, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. As always, please take care of yourself and take care of others because we all deserve it. We really, really do.